I doubt I'm the only person that does this, but the way that I tend to listen to new musical artists is that I go through their whole discography, album by album, chronologically, sometimes over the course of weeks or months, while I also read the story of the band generally through Wikipedia pages associated with each album. The natural result of this is that I end up listening to a lot of the same artists, typically with no one to talk to about it, because, of course, I'm the only person currently marathoning that band. I figure as long as I'm already sort of reviewing these albums in my head as I go, I might as well just write those reviews down and spew them out onto the internet with all of my other unsolicited opinions that choke the electronic ether. I'll try to spend less than a minute reviewing each album to try and keep things short, but this inaugural episode of what could become a series will still likely be the longest of any artist I would ever possibly cover. Because the artist that I'm covering is the prolific Frank Zappa. Even cutting compilations in nearly all posthumous releases, I still have roughly 60 albums to go through. Zappa was possibly the most creative musical mind of the 20th century, for better or for worse. His music could be comedic, poetic, dissonant, aggravating, disturbing, or moving, depending on what he felt like writing. He also utilized a lot of sexual and offensive content in his music, drawing the ire of would-be censors and fighting for First Amendment rights for much of the end of his life. If you don't like profanity, sexuality, non-PC material, then this is probably a good point for you to bail out, because Zappa's music is bound to have something that offends just about everyone. I think it was about halfway through the song Penis Dimension that I thought, this is really an acquired taste, and I think that most people who watch my videos might not like this. If you don't have a high tolerance for weirdness and a lot of patience for scatological shenanigans, then Zappa might just not be for you. But if you have an open mind, or you just like stupid prog music, then maybe you'll find something here that you like. Now, full disclosure, I started working on this video several years ago, around the same time as my Gunsmith Cats video, and as I said in that one, life getting in the way made it so that I'm only just now finishing it. Some of my opinions here have grown or changed a bit because in the time since writing and recording most of this video, Zappa has become one of my favorite artists. I decided not to rewrite everything and kept this more as my thoughts the first few times I listened to these records. I am hoping to make something more like an official ranking as a follow-up to this video that'll reflect my more current opinions. For now at least, in lieu of ratings, I'll be giving each album a color that lets you know whether I'd recommend it or not. Also keep in mind that this is based on my own tastes and your mileage may vary. If you're someone that likes jazz or prog rock or Weird Al, then these recommendations are probably going to make more sense to you than somebody who's into grindcore or Shania Twain or something. Alright, we ready? Good. Here it goes. Starting with... Freak Out. The first album by the Mothers of Invention. Frank Zappa's original band, which he wanted to call The Mothers, but was told he couldn't by the record company. It's a double album debut, which was unheard of in 1966. It also serves as an introduction to Frank's music, as it contains a mix of comedy, social satire, and old-fashioned doo-wop R&B, as well as sound collages full of incomprehensible noise. All these things are emblematic of Zappa's early career. It also originates many songs that would become recurrent throughout that career. Zappa is unique in that he would regularly rework and re-release songs. Some of the songs on Freak Out make an appearance in new and modified ways more than 20 years later. If I had to pick a favorite, I might go with Any Way the Wind Blows, but I also like Motherly Love, which is catchy but also doesn't have much meaning, and Hungry Freak's Daddy, which is an early Zappa social satire. There are others here that I like, but I feel like the later versions on later albums are superior. My least favorite songs on the album are what can politely be described as sound collages and less politely as noise. Help I'm a Rock is just avant-garde nonsense for five minutes, and the return of the Son of Monster Magnet makes me feel like I'm having a stroke. Regardless of how innovative or complex they might be, they're just not enjoyable to listen to. Still, this is the first album, it's mostly good, and it sets the tone for what's to come, so that makes it essential listening. Absolutely free. The second Mother's album goes a lot farther than Freak Out. It expands a lot on the weirdness of the previous album, while also dropping a lot of the commercial appeal. It also leans a lot more into the nonsensical noise and avant-garde ramblings, and ends up being appropriately less accessible. There are a few songs that are more straightforward, but when they're layered in with everything else, they end up feeling like jokes and sort of a 
haha, ha, we're so above these easy to write songs kind of way. I do like Brown Shoes Don't Make It, which is representative of the album's weirdness as a whole while also being memorable. Plastic People is also not bad, and Duke of Prunes and Colony Vegetables show up later in these albums in modified versions that I do like. I can't exactly call the rest of the album bad, except for maybe Amnesia Vivens, which is just like a minute of noise, but a lot of what's here is so couched in weird silliness and sarcasm that it makes it hard to get into, especially when there's such good music underneath whatever's happening. The only reason to recommend this one is purely that it's the second album and still formative, but that's not enough for me to give it any higher than Yellow. We're only in it for the money. This album has a lot of ups and downs. It was produced at the same time as Lumpy Gravy, and a lot of my complaints about that album hold true for this one. Specifically, the tape editing, sound collages, and spoken word stuff can be a bit grating. However, here it feels more focused and better incorporated with everything. There are some great songs here. Some are more accessible to general audiences, but some may be too comedic or odd, which unfortunately undermines their musical quality. A lot of them end up appearing in instrumental versions on later live albums, and that really helps them shine in my opinion. Zappa was an incredibly talented musician and composer, but some people in his life theorized that he sabotaged himself with vulgar or comedic lyrics. It kept a lot of his music off the radio, and it prevented his music from being taken seriously. One look at the Sgt. Pepper's parody cover art, and the title of We're Only In It For The Money, should tell you all you need to know about Frank Zappa's opinions on musicians that take themselves seriously and who write commercially appealing music. The songs also contain some social satire, like Who Needs the Peace Corps, which mocks the superficiality of the hippie movement, and Mom and Dad, which is about absentee parents, but also police brutality. My favorite songs on here are the ones that end up as instrumentals later on. Let's Make Their Water Turn Black, Harry You're a Beast, Take Your Clothes Off When You Dance, but I also like The Idiot Bastard Son and What's the Ugliest Part of Your Body. The worst stuff is hard, because it feels wrong to choose things when they're bad on purpose. And you've got songs like Nasal Retentive Calliope Music and The Chrome-Plated Megaphone of Destiny, which are just noise. But I'd say Flower Punk is probably the most annoying because it drags on too long while also still technically being a song. This album is still essential listening if you want to understand early Zappa and the overall philosophy of his work with the Mothers. It's the definitive early Mothers album, and one that some, very wrong people, claim he never topped for the rest of his career. Lumpy Gravy Zappa's first solo project, or at least the first project he didn't include the Mothers' name on, it only amounts to 30 minutes or so of music, and large parts of that are just noise. The main Lumpy Gravy theme is great, and there are parts sprinkled throughout that would eventually develop into full songs on later albums. There's also sections that are people having disjointed conversations recorded with their heads in a piano, which is part of a larger idea that only came to fruition on a posthumously released album decades later. There's also a lot of tape manipulation and editing techniques that sort of feel more included for experimentation than any pre-planned purpose. It's all really one long track, so it's hard to pick out specific things to recommend. All in all, I like the musical sections, but not so much the rest. This album is probably more for a completionist, when you consider the fact that the casual listener will get a lot of the best material here by listening to other Zappa albums. Cruising with Ruben and the Jets this one is a sort of concept album, containing only doo-wop and classic rock and roll songs. A few of them are songs from Freak Out, reworked to fit the style of the album. That's about it. Unfortunately, the concept of the album sort of hamstrings it, because it really is just a lot of generic 50s doo-wop, with a bit of Mother's weirdness thrown in. The tracks that stand out are ones I think were done better on Freak Out, or would be better done later on. It's a shame because Frank Zappa really loved doo-wop music and utilized it in various ways throughout his career, but it's done much better elsewhere. My favorite song would probably be Desiree if I had to choose, but mainly because I feel like I should pick one that's unique to this album. Worst is tough, but I guess I'd go with No 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 because there's really just nothing to it. Definitely a skippable album, and it's one that doesn't hang in my memory at all. <laughs> 
So much so that I literally forgot to record this section and I'm going back to do it after all of the other ones are recorded. Uncle Meat. This album was a tricky one to decide on. It could easily be blue, as this would be essential listening for someone that's trying to get a feel for Zappa's music, but in terms of accessibility, it's a bit dense. There's just so much here. The album mixes long improvisational pieces, tighter instrumental pieces, and more traditional but still weirder humorous songs. The spoken word pieces actually feel less disjointed on this one because they're often recordings of the band behind the scenes, like members explaining how they joined the band or arguing with Frank about the band's future. This album is sort of the penultimate record by the original Mothers before being disbanded, and it showcases what people love about that first incarnation. It has King Kong on it, which is a major piece of early Mothers music, and sort of justifies this album's existence all on its own. My favorite song, however, has gotta be Dog's Breath in the Year of the Plague. It's just a song that grabs me, and I enjoy it every time it pops up on Zappa's discography, all the way through the end of his career. Also, if you're a fan of Weird Al Yankovic, you might recognize this particular song from Genius in France, which is his eight-minute sort of ode to Frank Zappa, and is a song that I never really appreciated properly until I got through all of these albums. Weird Al is a huge Zappa fan, and I think it's sort of what inspired him to do what he did, which is kind of funny, because Zappa is incredibly obscene, and Weird Al is super wholesome and, like, never includes anything explicit on any of his records. The main Uncle Me title theme is also good, and it would pop up on Zappa's final album before his death, along with Dog Breath, so that should tell you how highly he thought of both of these songs. I would also call out Mr. Green Jeans and Cruising for Burgers as being pretty good. That's not to say the rest isn't good, it's just all interwoven into one musical experience, and it's kind of hard to pick out specific tracks. You really need to listen to the whole thing. So yeah, really important record for Zappa and the Mothers, and worth a listen. But it's possibly hard to get through if you don't like the style of the early band. Hot Rats. This is one of the early Zappa albums that the casual listener might be familiar with. It's mostly instrumental jazz fusion type songs, which gives it a much wider appeal. The opening track, Peaches and Regalia, is one of Zappa's best known, and for good reason. It's complex and technical, while staying focused and being pleasing to the ear, all in under four minutes. The rest of the album is great, but it can meander in places, especially with some of the longer songs. It's still a fantastic album, and great as something like a vinyl record to be put on and just run through from start to finish. It's probably the Zappa album that's most enjoyable to someone that can't get into his other stuff. Pretty much every song on here is good, but my highlights are Peaches, Son of Mr. Green Jeans, and the Gumbo Variations. My least favorite song on the album is Willie the Pimp. Not because it's bad, because it's not, it's just different. I mean, I actually really like it, but it's the only song on the album with vocals, and that kind of sets it apart by being stylistically different, and it's overall just a lot rougher and in your face than some of the more soothing jazz melodies you've got going on here. But honestly, that's a really weak criticism. If you only listen to one album on this entire list, Hot Rats would be a fine choice, even if a lot of these other albums just don't seem to be your style. Burnt Weenie Sandwich is the first of two Posthumous Mothers albums, considering that it only used previously recorded material, and it was released after Frank dissolved the band. Despite that, it's actually pretty good. It's mostly complicated instrumental pieces that I'm sure are much more interesting if you have a detailed knowledge of music theory and time signatures, but are still fun to listen to for the casual person in a more challenging way. It's full of what I like about the early Mothers albums. One of my favorite songs here is probably WPLJ, which kind of stands out as a jaunty, fun song, and it's a lot less complicated than the rest. But the theme from Burnt Weenie Sandwich is also great, and it's more representative of the album as a whole. The weakest song here is probably Valerie. It's not a bad song, but it comes at the end of the album after the impossibly intricate 19-minute instrumental tour de force that is The Little House I Used to Live In, and Valerie is just kind of an underwhelming doo-wop song. All in all, good album. Definitely the better of the two post-mortem Mothers records. Weasel's Ripped My Flesh is the other posthumous Mothers album. 
While the previous album contained everything I like about the first incarnation of The Mothers, this album has a lot more of what I don't like. I really didn't like this album on my first listen, but going back to it, the stuff I dislike stands out a little bit less. This album is more of the unreleased live material from The Mothers, while Burnt Weedy Sandwich was more unreleased studio material. Unfortunately, a lot of that live material is banging on instruments and wailing, which, while new and unconventional, is also annoying and not very pleasant to listen to. However, knowing you can skip songs like the prelude to an afternoon of a sexually around- eh, it's a fucking hard title to say, God damn it, Frank. However, knowing you can skip songs like Prelude to the Afternoon of a Sexually Aroused Gas Mask and the Eric Dolphy Memorial Barbecue, and go straight to songs like My Guitar Wants to Kill Your Mama and the Orange County Lumber Truck, takes some sting out of the record. My favorite song on this record would have to be Oh No, as it's one of my favorite pieces of music Zappa ever wrote, whether it's here, or as a movement in Lumpy Gravy, or anywhere else in the discography. Oftentimes the best songs on Zappa's records appear on other releases, and sometimes in better versions which kind of undercuts the album they came from. This is something true of Weasel's Rip My Flesh. The fact that you can get the best bits of this record elsewhere, and usually in better forms, stops them from rescuing it from being in the red. Chunga's Revenge, a pretty good album overall. This album is the beginning of the Flo and Eddie era of the band, which is marked by two former members of the Turtles, Mark Volman and Howard Kalin, joining the new version of the Mothers under the name Fluorescent Leech, Flo, and Eddie. This was due to legal issues concerning using their own names thanks to contractual obligations. Chunga's Revenge is not a bad album. It's overall pretty straightforward rock music with some jazz sprinkled in. You get a splash of social satire with Rudy Wants to Buy You a Drink, lampooning the idea of the Musicians' Union, which was a current topic at the time. But outside of a few great songs like 20 Small Cigars, which was rescued from the Hot Rat Session, and Charlena, the rest of the music is just good. Not outstanding, not bad, just good. This album just barely misses Green because a lot of the songs failed to be memorable. Live at the Fillmore East 1971 is a much better offering from the Flo and Eddie era of The Mothers. This album goes beyond just being live recordings of existing music. Zappa toured constantly, and throughout much of his career, recorded nearly every show he ever performed. This means a lot of the time songs would appear on the road and be played sometimes for years before they ever got released on any album. A lot of his albums become a mix of studio and live recordings, or even live recordings with studio overdubs mixed in. This album, however, is entirely pieced together from live performances at the Fillmore East in New York City in 1971. You get pretty much the whole show, which includes skits between songs that form a narrative about the band members trying to hook up with groupies, and stories about how certain more popular rock bands once did inappropriate acts with a woman in a hotel room using a mud shark. In a crazy turn, John Lennon and Yoko Ono were actually at one of the shows the album was cut from, and as part of the encore came on stage and performed live with Zappa and the Mothers. Lennon recut and released this particular recording on one of his own live albums, and Zappa tried to do the same, but then there was a bunch of slimy legal shenanigans where John Lennon was being kind of a huge dick, and it took a while for it to actually make its way onto a Zappa record. But it's a really interesting jam session, and it's really surreal to see. The whole thing is on YouTube if you want to check it out. All in all, the old music and the new music on this album is great, and the whole album is just a fun experience. Definitely the best the Flo and Eddie era has to offer. 200 Motels The first thing to know about this album is that it's a soundtrack. 200 Motels is a movie made by Zappa and his band. The movie itself is a bunch of disjointed nonsense and weird special effects. It doesn't have much in the way of a coherent story, despite supposedly being about what life is like when you're constantly on the road touring. The most value it offers probably comes from the fact that it was the first movie ever shot on video, and that a lot of the video effects used in it were revolutionary at the time. It also has Keith Moon and Ringo Starr in it, which is a bit of a trip. So much of it is made up of inside jokes, meta-humor, and personal stories from the band that you really can't understand it without a good knowledge of their history and familiarity with their unreleased live material that most people at the time 
probably wouldn't have. Some of the keys to getting this one come from albums towards the end of this discography that release live and behind the scenes stuff that the public at large would have no knowledge of in 1971. You can watch it if you want to hear Ringo Starr say fuck and pussy, but outside of that, it might be hard to enjoy unless you're a hardcore Zappa fan. A lot of this album is hard to get through. It's a soundtrack in the sense that the movie is a lot of scenes with various musical numbers in between, but that doesn't make for a very coherent listening experience. What you get are some solid rock songs interspersed with Zappa's ominous, disjointed orchestral music. It's not bad, but it's not something you can really sit down and listen to without added context, which isn't helped by how hard the album is to find. Thanks to issues with the rights, it hasn't been re-released on CD since 1997, and it's not on any streaming services like Spotify or Tidal. Is what I would say when I originally wrote this. But, since my first listen to this album off of YouTube, and the long period before releasing this video, Ahmet Zappa through the Zappa Family Trust released a 50th anniversary edition of this album. Now you can stream high quality versions of these songs along with like six CDs worth of other material, including various rough mixes and outtakes from tracks on this album, as well as other albums from this period of time. There's also dialogue protection reels, so like half of the 200 Motels movie is in here. They obviously make a lot more sense if you've seen the movie, but they're interesting to say the least. There are a few gems on this album, like Magic Fingers and Lonesome Cowboy Burt, along with some of the rock-oriented songs like Shove It Right In and What Will This Evening Bring Me This Morning, but the orchestral stuff is mostly unengaging instrumentals with or without completely nonsensical vocals over top. The one song from that side of things I would recommend is Penis Dimension, which the title really tells you all you need to know about that one. The most enduring song from this album is the finale, Strictly Genteel, which is a great orchestral piece of music that was used to close, although minus the vocals, a lot of Zappa's shows throughout his career. The version here has a great rock finale at the tail end of it, which might be my favorite song on the record. Originally, I had this one as a red because some of the best stuff was available on other albums and 200 Motels itself was hard to find, but with the 50th anniversary edition out, I think this one can definitely get bumped up to a yellow. It's an oddity and worth a look. It's just not for everybody. Just another band from LA. Another live album with some new material. It doesn't have many songs, but that doesn't mean this album is short. Billy the Mountain is the main reason to check this album out. It's a 24 minute audio narrative that is weird and hilarious with some great musical hooks spread throughout. The rest of the album is okay, but it's less of a draw than the opening track. I will say that the version of Call Any Vegetable on here is the one that I referenced earlier when I talked about Absolutely Free as being my preferred version of the song. One of the most notable things about this album is that the tour that produced it was one where a fan fired a flare gun inside of the venue and burned the whole thing down, which inspired the Deep Purple song Smoke on the Water. But even more importantly, this tour ended when Zappa was pushed off stage by a crazed audience member and almost died. The injuries left him in a wheelchair and crushed his larynx, which led to him permanently having a deeper voice after it healed. Being unable to tour, Zappa again disbanded the Mothers, meaning that this album is an end to the Flo and Eddie era. Waka Jawaka As a result of being wheelchair-bound and barely able to speak, Zappa shifted his focus and produced Waka Jawaka, a jazz fusion album akin to Hot Rats, a fact which is actually referenced on the cover. This is a great album in my opinion. Zappa's more jazz-inspired works have always been some of my favorites, and songs like Waka Jawaka and Big Swifty really show off his skill for writing instrumentals. It's a shorter album with just four songs, which makes it easy to recommend. The only song on here I don't like is It Might Just Be a One-Shot Deal, but even that song has its moments. Overall, I say give it a listen. The Grand Wazoo, the other mainly instrumental jazz fusion type album that Zappa produced post-accident. This one led to a return to touring with Zappa accompanied by a 20-piece band called the Grand Wazoo, and then later a smaller version of said band called the Petite Wazoo. This one is another great assembly of instrumental music, and while the title track, Blessed Relief, and Eat That Question are my favorites, the whole album is definitely worth recommending. Overnight Sensation This album is one of Zappa's best. I don't really think there's a bad song on here. You get the classic mixture of silliness, obscenity, and musical complexity that defines Zappa in a pretty succinct package. If 
I had to choose my lesser favorites, I might go with 50-50 or Zombie Woof, mainly because I don't like the vocals all that much, but that's a really weak criticism. Classics like Dynamo Hum, probably the gold standard for Zappa's vulgarity, uh, I'm the Slime, Montana, they're all some of Zappa's most enduring tracks, and they rise to the top of what is already an album dominated by top work. It also works as a good jumping on point for Zappa's music if you're less into the weird avant-garde elements of earlier Mother's work. I own this one on vinyl, and it's a great one to put on and listen to start to finish. Check it out. Apostrophe While the previous album was called Overnight Sensation, this album was ironically a much bigger commercial success. Apostrophe is Zappa's most successful album, and easily what he's most well known for. Ask any random boomer about Frank Zappa, and the ones who know who he is will know immediately that he's the guy that wrote Don't Eat the Yellow Snow. If they're lucky, they're saying that because they've heard the whole first half of this album, and not just the two-minute section that carries that title. The suite containing Don't Eat the Yellow Snow, Nanook Rubs It, St. Alfonso's Pancake Breakfast, and Father Oblivion is fantastic. But the other tracks on the album, like Cosmic Debris, Eccentrifical Force, Apostrophe, and Uncle Remus are also wonderful songs in their own ways. Honestly, the only song on this album I'm not a big fan of is Stinkfoot, but that one's a favorite of a lot of Zappa fans, so it kind of goes to show you the strength of this album overall. This is probably the Zappa album that most people who don't know Zappa are familiar with, and it does function pretty well as a starting point if starting with Zappa's less accessible works just isn't for you. Although, starting here would mean skipping the excellent overnight sensation. Definitely one of the best, and definitely worth checking out. Roxy and Elsewhere This one is a live album, but it's packed full of original releases. The only song on this album to have previously appeared is also my favorite, More Trouble Every Day, and it's hugely different from the original incarnation on Freak Out. The rest of the songs here are fantastic. Village of the Sun, Echidna's Arf, and Don't You Ever Watch That Thing blend into one brilliant composition. Son of Orange County takes the end of Oh No from Weasel's Rip My Flesh and turns it into something beautiful. The other songs are their own brand of excellent, and they also highlight some of Zappa's antics at his live shows, which really sound like a wild time to be had. Out of all of Zappa's albums, I think this is the one I've listened to the most during this undertaking. Whether in whole or in chunks, I just keep coming back to it in my car and elsewhere. This is another put it on and let the whole thing run kind of album. I highly recommend it, and it might be the best album on this list. One Size Fits All. Another fantastic album, and sadly, the last in this early 70s run of solid gold. That's not to say the albums that follow aren't good, they just become less consistently amazing for certain reasons. But before we can get to that, we have to acknowledge what a great album One Size Fits All is. Musically, it's very consistent with Overnight Sensation and Apostrophe, mixing serious musical acumen with general silliness, and noticeably less vulgarity. There really isn't a bad song on this album. The low points are low by virtue of not being as good as the standout songs on the album, but they're still good in their own right. That being said, the best stuff on this album is some of the best in Zappa's entire catalog. I'm not sure if I like it as a whole more than Roxy, but the high points are much higher. Inca Rhodes is in the running for my favorite Zappa song out of all of them, and Sofa, in all of its different permutations, is one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've ever heard. Even the more middling tracks like San Bernardino and Andy are great. One Size Fits All is a great album on its own. It's good if you just want to check out one album and not commit to more, thanks to its greater accessibility, which is in part due to the reduced vulgarity. But if you like this album, you definitely owe it to yourself to check out the three that came before it. Absolutely recommended. Bongo Fury. This one suffers from having to follow up One Size Fits All. Bongo Fury isn't bad. There are some great songs on here, Advanced Romance, Carolina Hardcore Ecstasy, and one of Zappa's more popular songs, Muffin Man. But the album is a collaboration with Captain Beefheart, who is, put politely, an acquired taste. You might be familiar with his work depending on what part of the internet you hang out on, because he's the man that made Trout Mask Replica. And if you want to know why that album is such a meme, I suggest listening to the first 20 seconds or so of it. You'll get the picture. A lot of tracks on this album are Captain Beefheart's surreal spoken word poetry pieces, and they're just not for me. 
The songs that I didn't mention and aren't spoken word just kind of failed to grab me. Bongo Fury's not awful, but it's not great either. Zoot Allures Zoot Allures is a weird one. I feel bad putting it in yellow because it really only has one bad song on it. The first one. It's an odd album that's only really possible for someone like Frank Zappa, who constantly re-releases and reinterprets his own music, because I think the Zoot Allures versions of these songs are generally the worst ones. The album is marred by a vocal choice by Zappa to do a lot of very low-pitched, soft, almost whispering vocals on every song. Maybe it's a personal preference, but I am not a fan. The Torture Never Stops, Miss Pinky, and Find Her Finer are some great songs if you listen to the more up-tempo or just differently sung versions that appear on other albums. Black Napkins and Zoot Allures are two of the best instrumental pieces of Zappa's career, and the versions on here are great, but I still like some of their later appearances more. Disco Boy is probably the only song on this album that is in its best incarnation here, which helps because it's a fun song. My recommendation for this album is probably still listen to it, but really do so so that you can bookmark these songs in your head for when they pop up again. But who knows, maybe you think these cuts are the best and I'm a fool. It's all subjective, really. Zappa in New York Another fantastic live album that also contains first releases of certain songs. Some of the old songs that appear here are massively different from the originals. See Pound for a Brown and Cruising for Burgers. Some of them are the same but better, like The Torture Never Stops, which we just saw on Zoot Allures. This version of I Am The Slime is cool because Don Pardo, the iconic announcer for shows like Jeopardy and Saturday Night Live, does a verse on it. He pops up a few more times on the album, which is pretty neat. There are a lot of fantastic songs making their first appearances here. Titties and Beer and Punky's Whips are both funny, and they show off drummer Terry Bozio, who has a big personality to match his playing. The Black Page 1 and 2 show off the virtuosity of Bozio's playing, and they showcase the kind of, as Zappa put it, statistical density present in some of his compositions. The Black Page was named for the fact that Zappa's compositions were so complicated that the sheet music he would give to his musicians looked completely black from all of the notes crammed onto the page. There's a great YouTube video of a drummer trying to learn the Black Page, and it really showcases just how hard the song is to play. Other good originals include Honey Don't You Want a Man Like Me, I Promise Not to Come in Your Mouth, and one of my personal favorites, The Illinois Enema Bandit. There's just so much stuff on here, and all of it is good. Listen to it. Something I didn't have time to mention about Zappa in New York also relates to this album. Zappa had consistent issues with agents and record companies, a problem he only really became free of when he eventually started his own. One of the biggest conflicts he had came from Warner Brothers, who took legal action to prevent him from releasing a 4LP box set that would have been known as Leather, spelled Lather but with an umlaut over the A. They originally refused to release it, and when he went to another label and tried to get them to do it, Warner Brothers obviously sued. This meant that the four LPs were released separately and without Frank Zappa's approval by Warner Brothers. Zappa in New York was the first album, and arguably the least affected by these issues. The other three do not come out as clean. Studio Tan, as the name would suggest, is made up of studio tracks rather than live ones. The cover art for this and the two remaining would-be leather albums were made by cartoonist Gary Panter, and are pretty ugly to put it bluntly. The albums seem short, what with having only four songs, but when you realize that one of those songs is the 20 minute long Gregory Peckery, it makes a little more sense. I know there are a lot of people out there that really like the adventures of Gregory Peckery, but I'm just not one of them. It's a long, silly story that goes nowhere, although I guess that's sort of the point, punctuated by bouts of good music. There are fun references to other Zappa songs, so if you've been listening all the way through all of this, maybe that's worth listening to. But if you're just picking and choosing between the good stuff on each album, it's kind of a hard sell. I mean, I really didn't like it the first time I listened to it, and while it's grown on me since, it's still not one of my favorites. The other three songs include the silly but not awful Let Me Take You to the Beach and the really good complex instrumental Redunzel. Revised music for guitar and low-budget orchestra is also pretty good. Considering that three out of the four songs are ones I actually like, 
And the other one is one that a lot of people like, and I'm just not a fan of. I think it definitely puts this album above water. However, when most of the album is dominated by the one song I don't like, it kind of messes up the balance. If you're somebody that likes Gregory Peckery, this album would fall clearly in the green. However, because I'm not so much a fan, I would have to say that it's a yellow. Sleep Dirt is the next of the leather fragments, and it's also another complicated story. Put simply, Zappa wrote a stage musical called Hunchin' Toot, which was obviously never produced. The entirety of the lyrics and stage directions can actually be found online, so if you're really interested, it is out there. But suffice to say, from what I know, it's really weird, and it involves, like, old sci-fi movies and giant spiders from outer space, so it's probably not everyone's cup of tea. A lot of the songs from Hunch and Toot made their way onto various Zappa albums, but the largest concentration of those songs is on this album. The eventual CD release of this album contained a lot of changes to the edit, most notably new drum tracks for several songs. I think this is the version that's widely available, so I can't really say I've heard the originals to compare. There were also vocals added to some of the Hunch and Toot songs in 1982, and they give them a really different feel. I found them on YouTube, but they probably made their way onto some of the various posthumous compilations that the Zappa Trust seems to release every single year. Regardless of its origins and the lyrical status of its songs, as it stands, Sleep Dirt is an entirely instrumental album that was even going to be called Hot Rats 3 originally. All of it is good, but not all of it stands out. It's easy for the songs to kind of blend together if you're not paying attention. I think Flambe and Regyptian Strut rise above the others, with The Ocean is the Ultimate Solution being the top of my favorites. This is a good album to put on in the background, and it's great for instrumental fans, but it's not life-changing or anything. Shake Your Booty The combo breaker that is not made up of material cold from leather and a real breath of fresh air because of it. It was released by Zappa Records and is completely separate from all of the Warner Brothers drama going on at the time. Apostrophe may be Zappa's best-known album in the States, but internationally, Shake Your Booty is his best-selling. A big part of that is my favorite song on the album, and one to avoid completely if you're easily offended. Bobby Brown Goes Down. While not especially complicated, it's catchy, it's funny, and it's raunchy. The song was a big hit in Europe where it managed to get a lot of radio play, something that would never happen stateside, and probably had to do with some of those countries not understanding English. Another controversial track, and another favorite for me, is Jewish Princess, a song about a stereotype that I'm sure was much more culturally relevant when this album came out, but now it's just a really catchy song with funny lyrics. Of course, the ADL didn't think it was particularly funny, but since when have they ever had a sense of humor? Two albums later, Zappa would make light of this by spreading the satire around with a song called Catholic Girls, which throws the melody from Jewish Princess in at the end. There will be more than enough to talk about when the album that song is on comes around, so I figured I might as well mention it here. Other great songs on this album include I Have Been In You, a joke about Peter Frampton's I'm In You, Broken Hearts Are For Assholes, Trying To Grow A Chin, City Of Tiny Lights, and Yo Mama, to name a few. One song, Dancin' Fool, was popular in the United States, and Zappa even performed it on SNL. The stuff I haven't mentioned is also good. I just don't want to spend even more time singing this album's praises. The last one I'll mention is Rubber Shirt, a song born of a bass track and a drum track, recorded completely separately, at different times, in different time signatures, and then put together to form what actually sort of works as one decent instrumental piece. This is something Zappa called Xenochrony, or Xenochrony, or however you pronounce it. Literally meaning different time. He used it a lot moving forward, and I think it's representative of a core piece of his philosophy towards music, which is being unpredictable by taking things that the laws of music say shouldn't work, and making people listen to it, for better or for worse. All in all, great album. Listen to it. Orchestral Favorites Orchestral? Yes. Favorites? Not so much. The two best songs on this album are Strictly Genteel, which you may have heard on the 200 Motels album, and Duke of Prunes, an orchestral version of a track from Absolutely Free. Zappa wrote a good deal of orchestral music in his life, and always saw himself more as a composer than a rock and roll musician. 
Unfortunately, I don't really like Zappa's orchestral music. When he's creating orchestral compositions of his other works, they're generally pretty good. But for his original orchestral works, more than often, they're very hard to listen to. They're discordant, chaotic, dark, and really inaccessible. I wouldn't blame you if you listened to Pedro's Dowry and thought it was just a bunch of people banging on their instruments in a vaguely improvisational fashion. But the fact that Zappa was a meticulous perfectionist who called the London Symphony Orchestra under-rehearsed should tell you that it's all by design, and even more so when he started composing with a computer. I'm sure for someone with an understanding of music theory that the blending of different time signatures and rhythmic patterns and keys and tempos is all very impressive. And that makes music fun to dissect, but not fun to listen to. Zappa wanted to write challenging music. Well, the problem with challenging things is that they're not really always fun. If this is the plebeian filter, consider me filtered. Joe's Garage is the first FZ album I ever listened to. I did so because I saw it on a list of the best prog albums ever made. Not that I would consider Zappa prog rock, at least not on paper. The album is a sort of rock opera telling the story of Joe, who follows his path as a musician from playing in a garage, to his girlfriend running away to live on a tour bus and service big time musicians, to seeking guidance from L. Ron Hoover at the Church of Appliantology and being told that he's a latent appliance fetishist, to picking up a sentient toaster in a bar and accidentally killing it when engaging in water sports back at the toaster's apartment, to being a prisoner whiling away his time thinking up imaginary guitar solos that would annoy an executive kind of guy, to doing the same thing but on the outside now after music has been made illegal. The story is loose, and it's mostly told from bits of narration by the central scrutinizer, a character who seems to be cautioning the listener against the dangers of music, while also proving that Frank Zappa invented ASMR. This triple album is packed with silly songs, dirty songs, complex instrumentals, long improvised guitar solos pulled from other sources, and just really good music. It's pure Zappa the whole way through. It made a great starting point for me because it had a little bit of everything from him. Of course, it was made better when I listened to it as a part of the greater discography because I recognized all of the inside jokes and musical references going on. That being said, it's still great on its own. The songs don't always work great out of context, but they still shine when set apart. There's too many good songs on here to mention, so I'll just point out that the best song on the album, and one of Zappa's overall best, is Watermelon and Easter Hay a beautiful guitar piece that is one of only a few songs that Zappa never wanted anybody but his son Dweezil to play after his death. The song is so emotional that perhaps the only person that can do it justice is someone who can't hold back the tears as he plays it knowing his father never will again. Kind of out of place on an album with a song called Why Does It Hurt When I Pee, but such is the duality of Zappa. Tinseltown Rebellion this is a really good album that I didn't appreciate at first due to the whole refractory period after the load that was Joe's Garage. Upon revisiting it, there's some great music here. Easy Meat, For the Young Sophisticate, the title track, and probably the best versions of Love of My Life and I Ain't Got No Heart. The album's mostly live material, so you've also got some fun live shenanigans, which are fun on first listen, but aren't really something you're going to be coming back to. There's an updated version of Peaches and Regalia, which is interesting, as well as Bamboozled by Love, which is one of my favorites, but sadly the version on this disc is not my favorite version of it. Overall though, really solid album. Give it a listen. Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar Some More, and The Return of the Son of Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. These three albums were released separately as mail-order only records. They're sort of a set in that they're all a collection of guitar solos pulled from live shows. Zappa recorded pretty much every live show he ever did, and when he felt something was particularly worthy, he would pull it out of its original context and use it elsewhere, doing so in a previously mentioned style called Xenochrony. This album doesn't recontextualize the live bits in that way, instead it's just a collection of live guitar solos. Zappa was a great guitarist and a top-tier improviser, so despite the fact that many of these solos come from the same song, they sound completely different. Unfortunately, they're so different sometimes from the song they came from that they become a little nonsensical. They're devoid of context, and the way they're cut means that the transitions in and out of the solo are wasted and occasionally jarring because the track just ends before the rest of the song comes back in. The track names also have little to do with the original song, so unless you're checking Wikipedia as you go to figure out where they came from, it's hard to tell. 
I would argue that the guitar solo should connect to the song it's in and serve a purpose in the greater framework. If it doesn't, it just becomes random noodling, even if the actual technique and musical architecture is brilliant. If I could take two solos and I can't even tell they're from the same song, the song really doesn't matter to the solo, does it? But that's really a personal opinion. And that being said, it's still a lot of good music. It's just very niche. You Are What You Is Another double album which had its beginnings as a completely different album called Crush All Boxes that was scrapped and split up. In its final form, it's a really great album that feels finely crafted with a high quality production and songs that flow seamlessly into one another. One segment starting with Society Pages and ending with Conehead was originally meant to be all one side of Crush All Boxes. This long song also contains Charlie's Enormous Mouth, which is incredibly catchy and one of my favorites on the album. Other great songs include the title track, Doreen, and Suicide Chump, and a few others like Harder Than Your Husband and Goblin Girl are funny, but not outstanding. Two really good songs on the album which end up being a little preachy are Heavenly Bank Account and The Meek Shall Inherit Nothing, both manifestations of Zappa's frustrations with organized religion and evangelists, which would become a larger and larger part of his act during the 80s. Other preachy songs that don't have the benefit of being catchy are Dumb All Over and Drafted Again, both of which I find more annoying than anything and usually skip. Overall though, it's a solid album and it deserves to be listened to from start to finish. Ship Arriving Too Late to Save a Drowning Witch The cover is my favorite thing about this album. I'm sure there are people out there who have this as their favorite Zappa album and more power to them, but for me it kinda falls flat. It's a relatively short album, so at least it doesn't overstay its welcome. No Not Now is decent, and so is Drowning Witch, which is really just an extended guitar solo with some setup at the beginning. But Envelopes follows a unique musical concept, and that makes it fun for music theory nerds out there. Just not enjoyable to anyone else. Teenage Prostitute and I Come From Nowhere are just kind of annoying. The song that saves this album from being in the red is Valley Girl. The song was Zappa's biggest success in the United States, and it's the other song your boomer uncle would probably know if you asked him if he's ever heard of Frank Zappa. It's a fun song, it's catchy, and it was co-written by his daughter, Moon Unit Zappa. She also does the annoying Valley Girl speak over the song, which is kind of a nice personal family touch to the thing. About half the songs on the album are good, so Yellow seems like the appropriate rating to give it, but I wouldn't blame you for skipping this one altogether. The Man From Utopia This is a Zappa album that I forget about a lot, which is weird because it's pretty good. I think some of it is that despite the longer track list, there's less substance here than you would expect. The Radio Is Broken, The Dangerous Kitchen, and The Jazz Discharge Party Hats are all talk sung pieces that kind of have a novelty feel to them. I've heard these songs described as utilizing Sprechstimme or Sprechgesang, which is a fancy German vocal technique, and that kind of oversells what these songs are. I like the Party Hats one because it's a funny, inappropriate story, but the other two aren't great. The title track is a mashup of two songs from the 1950s, The Man from Utopia and Mary Lou, which work oddly well when smushed together. Sex and Stick Together are also pretty good, and Luigi and the Wise Guys is a weird doo-wop track that's kind of defeated by its own silliness, but it's good if you like that kind of thing. Cocaine Decisions is one of my favorite ones on this album, and it shows off Zappa's frustration with drugs and the powerful people in the entertainment industry who use them. But by far the best stuff on this album are the instrumentals. Tink Walks Amok, We Are Not Alone, and Mogio are all intricate while remaining accessible. A talent of Zappa's harkening back to things like the Black Page, which sadly I think starts to get lost by this era in his career. I started off planning to put this album in yellow, but on review, I do think the good outweighs the bad, so I think I'm actually going to have to recommend this one. Baby Snakes There's really not much to say about this one. Album-wise, it's a soundtrack slash live album and not much else. The movie that it's a soundtrack for is a bit more interesting. I haven't seen the movie itself, but it's supposed to be a mixture of the live show the songs were taken from with some backstage antics and claymation segments by the stop motion animator Bruce Bickford. Bickford was a visionary genius. I first saw his work included with the live action version of Inca Roads from a different Zappa DVD on YouTube. 
where you can also find his claymation work for baby snakes. His work has a trippy stream of consciousness feel. Things melt into themselves and become new things, ever shifting in a fever dream-like array of on-the-nose symbolism and visual expression. It makes you feel like you're on drugs just watching them. Looking at his work, you can easily tell why Zappa thought so highly of him. There's a really interesting chunk of Alex Winter's Zappa movie from 2020 that covers Bickford and his relationship with Zappa. Although really the whole movie is worth checking out if you make it to the end of this video and still have any interest at all in hearing about Frank Zappa. That said, these segments are the most interesting thing Baby Snakes has going for it, and with this being an album, not the concert video, the visual element doesn't really exist here. So going by just the audio, it's mostly just an okay live album. London Symphony Orchestra. This is two volumes of orchestral Zappa music that you can generally find on things like Spotify put together into one. It is orchestral Zappa music, which means it's not to my taste, and it's probably not to most other people's taste either. Zappa went on David Letterman in 1983 and talked about how he spent his own money, generated from fans buying his records, to pay the London Symphony Orchestra to play his music. He also mentioned that due to a lack of money and time, the orchestra didn't get enough rehearsal in to play the music perfectly, and that he only achieved about 75% of what he would have wanted. Oh, uh, and then from the money that you get out of this, what do you have any plans for the next project? <laughs> there won't be any profit out of this. <laughs> now, Frank, come on. You can't. Uh, uh, it's that, impossible. Well, uh, good luck to you nonetheless, and uh, any time... <laughs> uh, Considering Volume 2 was released a full four years later, it seems like it took a while for Valley Girl to sell enough records to afford more so-called serious music. Zappa understood that writing popular music was what you needed to do to fund your less commercially viable projects, and it does make me feel a bit guilty for not appreciating the music he felt more passionately about. But, going solely on the music, I just can't recommend this one. Boulez conducts Zappa, The Perfect Stranger. I may not appreciate Zappa's orchestral work, but that doesn't mean that serious musicians didn't. This album includes three songs conducted by Pierre Boulez, yes I needed to look up how his name is pronounced, one of which, The Perfect Stranger, he commissioned himself. Aside from those three songs, the rest are pieces performed by Zappa's Synclavier, an early digital synthesizer that you could program notes into and have it generate music mimicking a variety of instruments. Zappa became a fan of the instrument because he could program in compositions and have them reproduced perfectly to the millisecond without any chance for human error. Zappa was a pioneer in this sense, and if he were alive today, I am sure he'd be passionately making use of the leaps in technology that electronic music has made to produce even more authentic sounding digital compositions. The Synclavier pieces on this album have a very dark and ominous feel to them, which is characteristic of Zappa's discordant orchestral style, but it's made a lot creepier by the computerized sound of the instrument. The whole album, orchestral and electronic, is very unsettling. It's another good if you like his orchestral stuff, but avoid it if you don't type album. Them or Us. The last truly great outpouring of wholly original studio music from Frank Zappa. It's weird to think that with roughly another 20 albums over the next 9 years, a lot of what's to come is recycled music, live compilations, and orchestral music. There are some more original songs taken from live recordings, but this is the largest amount of original material left. Thankfully, it's mostly good material. There's a little bit of everything here. Catchy but explicit songs like Baby Take Your Teeth Out and In France, long guitar solo heavy songs like Them or Us or Truck Driver Divorce, another hunch and toot left over in Planet of My Dreams, a 50s R&B cover with The Closer You Are, and two straight rock and roll bangers which are my favorites on the album, Stevie Spanking and Whipping Post. Stevie being Steve Vai, who you might know from being one of the most talented guitarists alive, and who you probably don't associate in your mind with Frank Zappa. These two songs are sung by Bobby Martin, who has a dynamite voice and is one of my favorite parts of Zappa's band from the late 80s. Whipping Post is an Allman Brothers cover, but it became a staple of Zappa's live show as a vehicle for awesome guitar solos. 
The last song of note is Be In My Video, a fun 80s pop style tune and a jab at David Bowie's Let's Dance, which mocks music video culture and what Zappa saw as the growing prioritization of appearances over musical quality. All in all, Them or Us is a very good record, and sadly the last truly essential Zappa album in my eyes. Francesco Zappa this is sort of a throwaway record. It's a collection of mid-18th century chamber music composed by an Italian named Francesco Zappa, who, as far as I know, is not a relative of Frank Zappa. Frank programmed Francesco's music into his synclavier, and the album is an electronic performance of that music. It's not particularly good, and it sounds like generic background music from some kind of 1700s period piece, so listen to a minute of it, and you've heard the whole album. Definitely a skip. Thingfish. This one could easily be in red, and it probably should be if you're not listening to all or most of these albums. Thingfish is the soundtrack of a never-performed Broadway show that repurposes a lot of old Zappa music and shoehorns them into what could loosely be described as a storyline, by adding in overdubs and making lyrical changes. The concept is that a pair of yuppies attend a Broadway show performed by potato-headed, duck-mouthed monstrosities called Mammy Nuns, who got that way because of a government experiment intended to create a virus that kills gays and blacks. The main Mammy Nun and titular character Thingfish is voiced by Ike Willis doing an impersonation of a character called Kingfish from Amos and Andy, which is to say that he talks like a 1940s racial caricature of black people. Over the course of the play, the husband yuppie turns gay and impregnates a blow-up doll while the wife becomes a man-hating feminist with a briefcase fetish. As a possible play, it's not great, and it's hard to see how it would be staged, but there are people who have done it, and you can actually find clips of their performances on YouTube. The album is very likely to offend a lot of people, and it's easy to take as racist, but it's actually trying to lampoon racism. Satire doesn't always land at the best of times, and the satire in Thingfish is very convoluted and easy to misinterpret if you're going in looking to be upset. Musically, however, the album is still pretty good. A lot of it is pulled from You Are What You Is, which I've already said is a great album. But it's hard to say that those songs are improved at all by having the words changed or random lines added over them. The spoken word sections can be funny in their weirdness, but they're not really musical. As far as original content, what little there is mostly isn't great. Brown Moses is really good, and I also like He's So Gay, although for that one I think there's a much better live version of that on a later album. And as far as changes to existing songs, easily the best thing is the musical monologue by The Evil Prince added to this album's version of The Torture Never Stops, which also ends up showing up on a later live album. Can I recommend the whole album based on those three things? Not really. But the curiosity value and the overall weirdness stops me from not recommending it at all, so it still gets to stay in yellow. Frank Zappa meets the Mothers of Prevention A pivotal moment for music and American culture as a whole came in 1985, when the Parents Music Resource Center, or PMRC, a group of the wives of powerful men in Washington, pushed for the censorship of inappropriate content in music. They made a list known as the Filthy 15, which consisted of songs from Judas Priest, Prince, Madonna, Black Sabbath, Cyndi Lauper, and others that were cited for lyrics about sex, violence, the occult, and drug use. This resulted in Senate hearings on the matter, with proposals that record companies rate or label explicit albums voluntarily, with the implied threat that if they didn't, the government would do it for them and be much less charitable about it. If you've ever watched a VH1 documentary about any 80s metal band, you've probably heard at least some of the hearing testimony from Dee Snyder, the lead singer of Twisted Sister. Frank Zappa also testified at these hearings. He condemned the attempt to infringe on the civil liberties of consumers and musicians, and he called them a distraction from other legislation, specifically H.R. 2911, a blank tape tax. I highly recommend watching it, as it's a sad reality that we continue to struggle with censorship and the insistence of people in power on the sanitization of media, rather than a focus on personal responsibility, informed parenting, and personal freedom. Frank Zappa Meets the Mothers of Prevention is a fantastic album name for an album that is sadly not fantastic. It's mostly pretty good. 
The truly great songs are limited to Alien Orifice and What's New in Baltimore, both instrumentals. What's New in Baltimore became a live staple with some lyrics added in, and it was a vehicle for a lot of guitar solos. Yo Cats is a funny song, dumping on session musicians that sounds weirdly like Catholic girls to me, and We're Turning Again is one that sticks out as really good, but there's a live version of it on a later album that I think is a lot better. The rest of the songs are just some okay synclavier pieces and sound collages. The most notable of these is Porn Wars, which uses a lot of excerpts from the PMRC hearings, and while it's interesting, it's definitely a listen to it once kind of track. So yeah, overall, just pretty good. I guess if you liked the Synclavier tracks, that might elevate it to green, but it's really up for you to decide. Does Humor Belong in Music? This one's really just a solid live album with some of the best live versions of the songs it features. There are a couple of songs where I think this is their first appearance on an album, like Let's Move to Cleveland and Hot Plate Heaven at the Green Hotel, both of which are really good and became more live regulars with long guitar solos. If I had to complain, I'd say Let's Move to Cleveland is overly long considering it's 16 minutes and just evolves into weird noises for a bit at the middle, but that's also kind of expected with this music. Another one making its first appearance is Cocksucker's Ball, which is really Zappa just trying to be as offensive as possible to people like the PMRC, and surprisingly, is not a song that he wrote. It's a real song that already existed. It's from like 1953. It's a super weird one. It's on YouTube. You can go find it. It's, it's, it's a crazy song. There's also surprisingly a live appearance from WPLJ, which is, in my opinion, kind of a hidden gem from Bert Weenie's Sandwich, and I was not expecting to show up on a live album. This album also has the superior version of What's New in Baltimore that I mentioned earlier. All in all, it's a great album. It's just easy to go back and listen to whenever you're in the mood. After the PMRC hearings, record companies did start voluntarily applying parental warning stickers to albums with offensive lyrical content. Jazz From Hell is notable in that it received one of these parental warning stickers despite being completely instrumental and having no lyrics whatsoever. You could argue this was because the name of one of the songs is inappropriate, but I think it was out of spite. Most of this album is Synclavier pieces. Some of them are a bit more accessible than Zappa's other orchestral works, but I also feel like I kind of only thought that because I listened to this album again after hearing some of the later Synclavier stuff at the end of Zappa's career. I actually kind of like Night School, and Saint Etienne, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, is just a good guitar solo taken from a live performance of Drowning Witch, which is kind of a weird inclusion as the only non-Synclavier song on the album. The standout here is G-Spot Tornado, which is actually really good and probably one of Frank's best orchestral works overall. He thought it was impossible for humans to play, but was later proven wrong on an album we'll get to in a little bit. The orchestral version is better, which kind of robs this album of what little I like about it, but if you're into Zappa's orchestral work, you might like this, and if you're not, well, it's probably just a hard pass. Guitar this one's another album of guitar solos in the same vein as Shut Up and Play Your Guitar. As such, most of my criticisms for that album apply to this one as well. It's good if you want to listen to a bunch of guitar solos outside of their original context, and it showcases Zappa's talents as a guitarist, but if you don't enjoy listening to that, then there's really not a lot here for you. For me, that puts it in yellow. You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 1. This one is the first of a series of six albums filled with various live recordings taken from throughout Zappa's career. Some of the albums that follow, follow more of a theme than others, and this first one pulls material from concerts from 1969 to 1984. There are a lot of live recordings here of interstitial bits within concerts. These include fun banter like Diseases of the Band in which Zappa introduces who plays what and what ailment they have, a drunken British audience member reading poetry into the microphone during the performance of the entire Don't Eat the Yellow Snow Suite, and lots of intros and setups to tracks, like the intro to Sofa. You get a feel for some of the running gags within concerts and throughout Zappa's career, which helps provide context to some of the earlier material, and it rewards those with good memory who've been paying attention and couldn't go to any of these shows live and really understand some of the antics that were going on. Other interesting parts of the album are one of the better versions of Big Swifty, a version of Zombie Wolf with Bobby Martin singing it, which I think is better than the original, and just a lot of good renditions of various Zappa tracks from throughout his career. Overall, it's a solid album and definitely worth a listen.
You can't do that on stage anymore, Volume 2. This one is the most focused of the series, considering it's theoretically one 1974 show in Helsinki, even though it's technically two or three shows stitched together. The set list has a lot in common with Roxy and Elsewhere, but I think the versions of those songs that are here aren't as good. Notably, Village of the Sun, which I love, is played in double time, which is interesting, but I think it kind of detracts from the song. There's a lot more live antics and running jokes. One includes how the band seems to have gotten caught at German customs with some hotel towels in their bags, and they were not happy about it. There's skits mocking the encounter sprinkled throughout the set, including the track Room Service. One standout is Redunzel, which is cool to hear live, and coupled with the chaotic approximate, really shows the virtuosity of the band and just how tightly tuned in practice they were. Ruth Underwood, the percussionist for this era, was amazing on the marimba, and this album showcases her in a nice way. The last thing I'll mention is that on Montana, a fan shouted a request for Whipping Post, which got a laugh from everybody and led to Frank changing a lot of the lyrics to Montana on the fly. It also eventually is what got him to add the song to the band's repertoire. It's a fun example of the lyrical changes and secret word gags that the live shows used to have that doesn't really translate to the studio albums. Broadway the Hard Way. Another live album, but this time separate from the You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore series, this one adds to the big pile of live albums that dominate the tail end of Zappa's career. This is one of three albums that were taken from recordings from his 1988 world tour. This particular album follows a sort of theme in that it's primarily new material, and that it is very political. This tour occurred during the 1988 election, so if you don't know much about American politics, that was the election won by George Bush Sr., and it was also the one where a guy named Pat Robertson ran in the Republican primary. Robertson was a Christian televangelist, and that earned Zappa's ire because to him, the idea of a Christian televangelist in the White House, especially after the moral crusade of the PMRC, seemed like an affront to the U.S. Constitution. Zappa spent a lot of the 1988 tour mocking Robertson, as well as fellow televangelists Jimmy Swagger, Jim Baker, and his wife Tammy Faye Baker. Of course, he targeted televangelists back on You Are What You Is, but this time it's much more specific. He also mocked George Bush and had voting registration booths out in the lobbies of his shows, something in line with the encouragement of his fans to vote that he included in the liner notes of many of his albums previously. The album also targets Democrats on occasion. It takes aim at racial activist Jesse Jackson, primarily his anti-Semitic remarks that helped him lose the 1988 Democratic primary. All of these political messages end up doing two things. First, they make the album feel extremely dated. The only reason I feel like I have to explain who a lot of these people are is that most people watching will have no idea. Most people don't know or care about the 1988 US election. Pat Robertson just died last year at 93, and barely anyone cared who he was when he went. Social satire is all well and good, but this album is targeted in a way that it makes you have to keep checking Wikipedia to get half the jokes. A lot of Zappa's older commentary was more broad, and it could relate to a lot in any decade. Broadway the Hard Way is very much of its time. It's a time capsule, and that kind of limits its appeal. Secondly, this also makes the album very hard to recommend. If you're a Republican, this album will probably irritate you to some degree. And if you're a Democrat, it still also might irritate you to some degree. If you're somewhere in the middle, you might be fine because it's not targeting you directly, but you're also probably someone that doesn't want to listen to a bunch of political messages in that case. I just want to enjoy the music, but it kind of ends up feeling like I'm listening to family members argue at Thanksgiving. And that's really unfortunate because none of these songs are bad from a musical standpoint. I really like Any Kind of Pain, Jesus Thinks You're a Jerk is really catchy and fun even though it's the preachiest song on the album, but when it comes to recommending it to other people, it just feels awkward. If you don't mind people telling you who to vote for, it's worth a listen. If that's gonna bother you, then it's probably a skip. Barcelona the Hard Way. This one's kind of just an honorable mention, because it's not a live album, but it should be. There's a live recording of one of the shows on the 1988 tour in Barcelona. You can find Barcelona the Hard Way on YouTube in shockingly good quality, and it's absolutely worth a watch. I've watched through it a bunch of times throughout listening to all of these albums, and it's really interesting to see how my feelings have changed as I've gotten more familiar with the songs in the show. 
The set list is a lot less political, with a lot of the songs from Broadway the Hard Way not appearing. Jesus Thinks You're a Jerk is still there, but I think it comes off better when you're watching it and you can feel the humor a little bit more than the spite. There's two songs specifically in this show that this is my favorite version of them. The rendition of Bamboozled by Love here is faster and way more lively, and Illinois Enema Bandit being sung by Bobby Martin is amazing. The rest of the songs are good performances with great energy overall. It's a great concert, and I wish the Zappa Trust would just pull the audio from it and release it on a CD, just so I can listen to all of these versions on Spotify and not have to keep going back to YouTube. More recently, they put out an album of the last US show Zappa ever played, and that was taken from this tour, and there's a lot of similarities to the Barcelona show. It has the same faster version of Packard Goose with the classical music and Cowboy Burt thrown in the center of it, but it's missing Bamboozled by Love and Illinois Enema Bandit, so it's not quite what I'm looking for. It's a pretty good album, and it sort of scratches that itch, but I still end up coming back to Barcelona the hard way pretty regularly. If after watching through this whole video, you're in the mood to see some live performance by Frank Zappa, this is absolutely the concert to go for. You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 3. The third installment of the You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore series, this one doesn't have as much focus as the others. The closest you get to a theme is that the first half is taken almost entirely from a handful of shows played by the 1984 version of the band. There are also songs taken from two really notable events in the band's career, the first being a performance of King Kong the night that Zappa was pushed off stage and almost died. The other is Cocaine Decisions and a song whose title I don't think I can say on YouTube and probably shouldn't say in real life either, from a show in Italy that turned into a riot where they had to deploy tear gas, and which was ultimately immortalized on the back cover of the Man From Utopia album. Outside of this, the rest of the album is just pretty good versions of a lot of Zappa songs. Some of them have a bit of a weird mix. Bamboozled by Love seems like it has Ike Willis turned down, so the harmony takes priority in kind of an interesting way. There's also a lot of joking around that comes through here, with half of Bobby Brown and a lot of Keep It Greasy being the band just cracking up. There's also a few first-time appearances here, like Ride My Face to Chicago, which is mostly just a funny name. The standout in this mostly average live album is Charlena, which is a version performed by Frank Zappa and his son Dweezil. The guitar solo starts with Dweezil alone and ends up with Frank playing it with him, and it's a really cool moment between father and son. It's also the first song, so you probably would just be fine to listen to that and skip the rest of the record if you're not interested. The Best Band You've Never Heard in Your Life The second of three live albums assembled from the 88 tour, The Best Band You've Never Heard in Your Life is appropriately in the middle for me preference-wise. The album is less focused than the other two, containing kind of an eclectic selection, although I guess that also sort of more accurately reflects what a show on the tour would have been like. There's good stuff in here, like a surprisingly large number of songs off of One Size Fits All. There's also a lot of older stuff thrown in, which is nice, like Who Needs the Peace Corps and Mr. Green Jeans. There's also some interesting covers like Bolero and Stairway to Heaven, and even the Godfather theme makes its way in there. Of course, some of those covers also make up the low point of the album when Ike Willis is doing his weird thing fish, Amos and Andy, racist, kinda black guy voice over Purple Haze and Sunshine of Your Love. There's also a lot of that political stuff that made it a little hard to recommend Broadway the hard way because later on the album, they change out some of the lyrics on songs to make fun of Jimmy Swaggart, meeting a lady of negotiable affection at a hotel and that whole scandal. So it's definitely a mix of high points and low points. That being said, I don't think the low points are that low, and I don't think the high points are that high. So really, it's just kind of mostly in the middle. It's decent. It's more one that I just listen to specific songs off of rather than the whole thing through. So I think appropriately, it would go in yellow. You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 4. This is another album that's less focused, with more songs pulled from a variety of albums and time periods. What unites them is that a lot of these songs aren't really on other live albums, or in their usual forms here. Stick Together and Brown Moses are examples of this, but my favorite here is the Evil Prince monologue from Thingfish, which this is the only time that ever appears as its own song. There's also some more rare cuts like Love of My Life performed at the Mud Club, a modern version of Willie the Pimp with Ray White on vocals, and the original Torture Never Stops, which is more bluesy and sung by Captain Beefheart. The album also closes with a medley of different R&B oldies, which is nice. 
All in all, it's surprisingly good, despite being a bit eclectic. I think the presence of those songs that don't come up as frequently in other albums, combined with some of the interesting little historical pieces, are enough to elevate this into green for me. Make a jazz noise here. The last of the trio of albums from the 1988 tour, and for my money, the best. This one is much more focused on instrumentals from the set, although not entirely so. You get instrumentals of older stuff, which leads to my favorite versions of Let's Make the Water Turn Black, Harry or a Beast, The Orange County Lumber Truck, Oh No, and the theme from Lumpy Gravy, which all blend together into one long medley that's fantastic. There's a really good version of Black Napkins, which is nice. You've also got Big Swifty, Dupree's Paradise, and King Kong, as well as an orchestral version of Alien Orifice, which was originally a Synclavier piece. Speaking of the Synclavier, that's the weakest part of the album for me. Zappa brought it with him on tour for the first and last time, and songs like When Yuppies Go to Hell are a mixture of Synclavier, live improvisation, and lots and lots of editing. It's really different from the rest of the stuff on the album, and the weird recorded noises of vocal nonsense pitched up and down into different notes until it almost sounds like Banjo-Kazooie dialogue finds its way into other songs and, in my opinion, always detracts from them. A lot of Zappa's songs, and really prog songs in general, end up falling apart in the middle and just turning into slow, random notes and out-of-tune playing, before eventually stumbling back into the main melody and tightening back up into something listenable. Ultimately, this always ends up being really unfocused, and it makes it feel like you could just cut the middle out of the song, shortening the length and having a much better track at the end of everything. Big Swifty and King Kong are guilty of this, and they felt a lot more grating on this album than they have in the past. The album is still really good, and there's a lot of the better versions of songs from previous albums here, but that sort of meandering pace that other ones have kind of come with a caveat that you might want to fast forward through the middle bits. That being said, it's still not enough to pull it out of green for me. One last thing that's not really specifically related to the album, but is, I think, kind of fun and worth mentioning. The last song on the first side of this album is called Star Wars Won't Work. It's about an ill-fated Reagan-era proposal that they wanted to put satellites into space with lasers that were gonna shoot down missiles if Russia ever tried to attack. It didn't end up going anywhere, and people nicknamed it Star Wars to kind of mock it. Well, something I didn't know is that, I guess, Spotify for any Star Wars songs, we'll change that little progress bar into a lightsaber, which is fun, but it doesn't know that this song is not about the movies, it's about a, a failed missile defense system, and so it does that for this song, and I, I don't know, I just thought that was funny and worth mentioning. You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 5. This album is split in two, with the first half being tracks from 1966 to 1969, which means the original Mothers, which means a lot of avant-garde nonsense. The second half is the 1982 band, which means a lot more of the songs that made the regular rotation through this glut of live albums. So essentially the first half is a lot of that random chaotic noise I don't particularly care for, and the second half is just a lot of songs that we've heard a lot of so far. It's not all bad, though. And it's not all live. Some of the stuff from the 60s is tour bus recordings and skits, and those are honestly the best part of the first side of the album. There's also a drum duet between Zappa and Jimmy Carl Black, Fake Bean Boogie and Here Lies Love or Fun. It's just underwhelming. The second half is just songs we've heard a lot of by this point. I like Shall We Take Ourselves Seriously and Dead Girls of London, which are new, but the rest are songs we've heard before, even if they are good ones. I think there's enough here to pull it up out of red, but it's definitely far from being in green. You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, Volume 6. The sixth and final installment in the You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore series, Volume 6 goes back to a more focused format in that it's primarily concerned with obscenity. The first track is the Anti-Smut Loyalty Oath, only to be followed by the Poodle Lecture which relates to the unique ways in which white girls express themselves, so to speak, and gives previously unknown context to the song Dirty Love. That pretty much sets the tone going forward. Not everything on the album is dirty. It has We're Turning Again and an instrumental version of Take Your Clothes Off When You Dance that are definitely my favorite versions of those two songs, but most of what's here is focused on sex. 
200 motels get some representation with Shove It Right In, Magic Fingers, and the finale from the movie, although Magic Fingers is a later version of the song sung by Ray White. There's also a version of Lonesome Cowboy Burt, which I always forget is originally from 200 Motels, and it's actually a really cool back and forth between a modern performance in 1988 and an original one with Jimmy Carl Black back in 1971. Other highlights include a rare appearance by Catholic Girls and Crew Slut off of Joe's Garage, and some stage banter including tracks explaining the origins of Miss Pinky and I Have Been In You. It's a really good record. It's got great versions of the songs that are on it, it has a really well-defined theme, and it's probably my favorite of the entire You Can't Do That On Stage series. Playground Psychotics. This album is more of a documentary than it is an album. The discs are separated into A Typical Day on the Road, Parts 1 and 2, and The True Story of 200 Motels. Most of it is audio recordings of the band from 1971 while they were touring and making 200 Motels. There are songs, yes, but they aren't really the highlight of the album. The concept is to use real recordings from everyday tour life to show you what things were like behind the scenes on the road and making the movie. While the music is kind of taking a back seat, the album does contain a recording of the live jam that John Lennon played with the Mothers as an encore to one of the two shows that went into making the Fillmore East album. Less historically relevant but still fun is a version of Billy the Mountain that kind of shows the improvisation that differentiated renditions of the song, and as far as I know it's the only other version of the song to make it onto an album while Zappa was still alive. I'm not giving Playground Psychotics red because it's bad. It's actually really good. It's just completely inaccessible if you're not really into all the Zappa stuff. If you do what I did and you listen to everything, it's a really cool experience. If you're just picking out the best albums to listen to here and there, you should feel completely comfortable skipping it. Ahead of Their Time This one is sort of unremarkable on its own. It's a live album taken from a concert in 1968, and it's supposed to be a sort of musical play, which means there's a visual component that's missing here, and that kind of takes away from it. The audio quality is not amazing, so what you're left with is a somewhat confusing album with just okay recordings of first-era mother songs. The second half, after the epilogue of the performance piece, is mostly nice instrumentals, and I think it's probably the better half of the album. I think what was going on here is that Zappa was starting to get a bit nostalgic. By this point in his life, Frank Zappa had been diagnosed with prostate cancer and was declining rapidly. An album celebrating the 1971 band showcasing their lives while they were making this misunderstood movie seems like a good thing for an often misunderstood man to put out near the end. Another album showcasing a live performance from the original incarnation of The Mother's Band? A band that never got to release a live album like later versions would? A band whose main draw was their improvisation and live experience? A band for whom the bulk of their work was unreleased and starting to become lost? A band that was ahead of their time? Makes sense to me. It's just a shame what's here isn't better. The Yellow Shark This is the last album released while Frank Zappa was alive. At the end of his life, he focused on his composing, both for Synclavier and, in this case, with an orchestra called the Ensemble Modern. Zappa worked tirelessly with them and, in September of 1992, performed his work at two shows in Frankfurt. This album is taken from those performances, at which Zappa conducted only a few songs. A year later, the album was released in November of 1993. One month later, Frank Zappa died after a three-year battle with prostate cancer at the age of 52. It's insane to think of the amount of music this man put out during his life when he died so young. You can only really wonder what another 30 years of music from him would have sounded like. What kind of compositions would an 83-year-old Frank Zappa be writing today? If the Yellow Shark is any indication, they would be unlike any music anyone's ever heard before. This album is a mix of new orchestral work and classic Zappa songs brought into an orchestral setting. Classic songs like Dog Breath, Uncle Meat, and Pound for a Brown sound fantastic when they're performed this way, and they're definitely the high point of the album for me. There's a few theatrical pieces like Food Gathering and Post-Industrial America and Welcome to the United States that are weird but fun and I kinda like. The rest are songs that are more in line with Zappa's orchestral style, which is to say dark, ominous, and seemingly random. I've already expressed my thoughts on his orchestral work, but a room full of German music lovers gave this performance a standing ovation. There very clearly is something here that I don't see. 
I would never call this music bad, it's just not easy to enjoy for most people, me included. The final song is G-Spot Tornado. It's the best song on this album and one of the best songs of his entire career, now properly realized by a real orchestra and not a computer. It's a brilliant song and a perfect note to end a lifetime on. The Yellow Shark is not for everyone. Most of it's not even for me. But if you want the best version of Zappa's orchestral work and to really understand what he wanted to do with his life, this is the album you need to listen to. Civilization Phase 3 This is the first Zappa album released posthumously, but by no means the last. If you're going by Wikipedia's list, there are over 40 posthumous Zappa albums, which are mostly just made up of compilations or unreleased live recordings, so I feel like most of them don't really count. I don't really feel like listening to all of them, and I definitely don't feel like talking about all of them, so I'm going to stick to three posthumous albums that stand out to me. Civilization Phase 3 stands out because it is made up of original material. Zappa completed it before his death, and it was released just under a year later. The album is described as an opera, but that's kinda stretching it. It's mostly orchestral Zappa played by either the Ensemble Moderne or Synclavier intercut with tracks of people talking with their head in a piano. That's right, this is the album that ended up being the realization of the concept started by Lumpy Gravy decades before, and it uses recordings from that time, plus some new ones done in the same way. Most of what's said is surrealist nonsense, and any story people try to draw from it about people living in a piano and being afraid of the outside world seems like reaching at best. I will say the album is more focused and musical than Zappa's other orchestral work, but it's only for short bursts in between long sections of weird plonking noises and sporadic percussion. If you like Zappa's previous orchestral work, then it's for you. If you don't like it and you're not a completionist, then it's definitely a skip. Leather. Leather is the album that never was. Originally intended to be released as a four-album box set, the album was split up and released separately by the record company, as mentioned earlier in the video. This is the official release of the original complete album, which was previously only available as a bootleg. It's more than a compilation album. There's differences between the old versions of songs and the versions that are on here. There is some previously unreleased material, and there's the addition of spoken word and random instrumental sections as filler in between the tracks. But some of the alternates feel a bit thinner and they lack harmonies, which you can kind of see on The Young Sophisticate and Trying to Grow a Chin. The songs are still good for the most part, and I enjoyed listening to it, but it doesn't add much new to the discography. It's not even like a live album with different interpretations of songs because it is just the same versions of those songs on this album. It's a nice sort of victory lap if you've already listened to every other album, and it works as a way to listen to all four of those albums arranged in the track order that Zappa had originally envisioned, but if you decide to skip it, you're not missing much. Transfusion the last album I'm going to cover is not necessarily the next album in the sequence, but it's important because it was completed by Zappa before he died, and then finally released 13 years later. That being said, it's not original material. The album is made up of guitar solos taken from various live shows, much like the previous Shut Up and Play Your Guitar and Guitar albums. It's good, but like the other two, I'm less of a fan of out-of-context guitar solos, and they start to blend together after a while. It's still an interesting album that shows off the skill of Zappa's guitar playing and his talent for improvisation. And when matched with the two previous guitar solo albums, they form sort of a progression, with a lot of the solos being taken from the same songs, but played at different times during his career. You get a nice picture of how his guitar playing evolved from the first album to the last one. Another nice bit about this one is it has two different tracks that contain guitar solos played with Dweezil, including the closer on the album, Bavarian Sunset, which is great and a really nice way to cap things off. With all that said, I would still mainly recommend it to somebody who's really in deep with all of this, and you shouldn't feel the need to continue on to this one when the Yellow Shark is already a much better stopping point. And that's it. Well, not exactly. Like I said, there's a ton more albums. There have been like eight released since I started listening to Zappa and making this video. The Zappa Family Trust is doing these 50th anniversary re-releases, and they also just put out albums that are complete concerts, usually revolving around a theme like happening near Erie, Pennsylvania. Some of them have unreleased material, and some are just live or unfinished versions of songs we've become pretty familiar with by this point. 
Some of them I've listened to, some of them not yet. But the sheer amount of audio that Zappa must have recorded for them to be able to keep putting out more of it every year, more than 30 years after his death, is a true testament to how hard the man worked. He lived and breathed music. And I'm grateful that I took the time to listen to it because he's become one of my top three artists since I started this. Frank Zappa was a genius. He was a visionary musician and a visionary person. I haven't even touched on the fact that he came up with an idea for something that's basically iTunes or Spotify before the internet was even invented. Despite everything I've watched, listened to, and read, I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. But I can't wait to grab a shovel and dig in deeper. And I hope that this video, if you made it this far, has inspired you to do the same. And who knows, maybe one day we might just get the orchestral stuff too. Thank you so much for watching this video if you've made it this far. I know that this is kind of a complete departure from everything I've done previously, and I said at the beginning that I kind of want to make this into a series, but we'll see what happens, because other bands that I'm interested in, I don't know if there's going to be quite as much to dig into. Like, Frank Zappa is a really meaty topic, and just put out so much, and I don't know if other bands are going to have enough to really sustain the interest level for as long as, as this video was. That being said, because this is kind of a new direction, I'd really love to hear in the comments what you thought. Did you like it? Did you not like it? Would you want to see more stuff about music? Do you think I should just stick to anime? I was planning to do some kind of a follow-up, uh, hopefully like a kind of tier list of all of the albums, because just putting them into categories is one thing, but uh, I think ranking them is something I wanted to do, but I don't think it would really fit with the overall length and, and kind of direction of this particular video. But if everybody in the comments is telling me, no, we're not, we're not interested in this music stuff, we don't want to see that, uh, then maybe I won't do that. Really, I, you know, that's why I want your feedback. That being said, whether or not I do the follow-up, the next thing that I put out is going to be anime-related. I have a whole bunch of ideas for videos, not enough time to do them. Uh, I'm currently rereading a series so that I can get an, another RTFM done. So, like, this isn't just, like, a drastic shift in everything. This is just something that I was working on in my free time while I was working on the Gunsmith Cats video and, and actually had to kind of wait to finish it because I didn't want to disappear for two years and come back with something completely different. I wanted to show that I'm, I'm still doing the anime stuff. So yeah, let me know what you think in the comments. And again, thank you so much for watching. I don't know why you made it this far, but I do really appreciate it. And I will see you in whatever comes next.